<clears throat> okay, everybody, this is being recorded. One thing I say at the beginning of every single webinar, I know for you guys that have been in here for a lot of these webinars is it's a broken record at the beginning of these webinars, but watch it again or watch one of the other broken wing butterflies because you guys really drive the content in these webinars. You know, I feel free to ask questions throughout this because I want to make sure you're clear concept before we move on. And therefore, all of these webinars, even though I may have done a broken wing called butterfly before, that content may very well be much different than the content you get in this one. So, uh, and with those questions, throw them out there, like I said, at any time, because I want to make sure we're clear before we move on. I don't want you thinking about questions or getting lost as we go along here. But let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. My name is Eric Wilkinson, and yes, you may recognize me from mainstream media. They used to call me the Wolfman, but I actually started trading in college with some money I had earned and uh, decided to switch it from psychology over to finance. And in that time, I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodity futures, and currencies, and options on all these products and just about all market conditions. Uh, yeah, we got to go over this disclaimer real quick. And basically it says any opinions, news, research or analysis or other information should be construed as general commentary and does not constitute investment advice. Right. I'm actually probably going to be talking about, you know, stocks that I may very well have in my portfolio. I'm not trying to get you guys the limbing off the cliff with me. All right. I'm just here to try to teach you different option strategies to implement into your portfolio. And a lot of times those examples are what I've come up with. So therefore, you know, I'm going to put those in my portfolio. Um, anyway, bottom line is do your own homework, past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right. You can follow me on Twitter at Wolfman's blog uh, and our parent company at Pro Trader Strat. Also, we have a Facebook page where we're throwing out a lot of content on there. I do daily market commentaries, so you can find some of those on there as well. Uh, in those daily market commentaries, I talk about these strategies and when I implement them, how I trade them. And I'm not cherry picking you guys. If a strategy is going against me, I am talking about how to manage it. So I probably talk about the trades that are losing trades more so than the winning trades. And no, that is not me making those funny noises. That is my dog having a uh, some kind of dream over there. All right. This is the broken wing butterfly. Uh, we're doing the call broken wing butterfly here. It's also known as a skip strike butterfly or wounded wing butterfly in other places. I learned it as the broken wing call butterfly. So that's how I'm going to pretty much talk about it as we go along. All right. Um, all right. So a couple of things we need to know with this uh, skip strike butterfly or the broken wing butterfly is we must have a market assumption. All right, we're going to have a market assumption. We need high implied volatility. Our market assumption, though, is going to be with this. It's going to be, you know, neutral. We want a sideways market here, but we are we don't want it to go up. All right. So that's kind of out of the question. But to the downside is OK, because we're going to build this out where if the market trails off now, we're not going to get the max profit on it. But we're eliminating the risk to the downside and we want high implied volatility percent of greater than 50. All right. And collect a credit or nothing. All right. Credit or a scratch. You guys, the reason why we want to do that is we're going to actually, rather than just the, the call butterfly, we're adding a little bit of risk to the upside, but then our, reason for doing that is to eliminate all risk to the downside. So there's no sense in adding risk to one side when you still have risk to the other side with this strategy. Okay. So that's why we're going to build it out this way. Uh, we need to have at least a market assumption where we think it's going to be a pretty much sideways market to, uh, if it goes down, we're okay. All right. And then uh, <clears throat> here's how we're going to set it up. I usually do it on the at the money or just even you can even do the out of the monies here as well all right just slightly maybe one tick one tick out of the money all right if you're going to go out of the money but usually we're going to kind of build it up at the at the money short or uh, long call there then we're going to move one strike out so two out of the money calls and then skip a strike meaning like say for instance this was the 40 strike 
that we're at the money, the underlying X, Y, Z is trading $40 right now. All right. And then we're going to basically be buying the at the money. So we'd be doing the 40 call. And then say, for instance, we went out and did the 41 calls. Then this one would be a 43 call. All right. You know, vice versa, you know, the higher implied volatility goes if IV, if implied volatility percent is at 100, all right, you might actually be able to build this out where you go 40 and then um, this could be the 43s and then you'd go 46 or sorry, uh, I did that wrong. So that would be even. So we'd have to go to 49. So something like that. Um, the regular butterfly was the first one I built out. So 49 would be the strikes we could do. And that, believe it or not, if, if this would be in low volatility here, you know, you would see the market be able to give you these kind of strikes and really high implied volatility. All right. So that's what we're going to look to do and why we kind of do it with high implied volatility, because when you have the low volatility, uh, it's your your broken wing butterfly is going to be a little bit different. It's a play on Vega also. As volatility comes out, our strategy will be more profitable quicker, all right? So it is a play on volatility and we're gonna then exploit theta. Because remember, what we're doing here with the broken wing butterfly, if let's just say, um, I don't, I'm don't, i gonna pull up a different thing so I can get a straight line here. Otherwise it's gonna, my lines are almost never straight. So let's just say I come up with a straight line right here. So this would be, for instance, break even. And if we look at the broken wing butterfly, our uh, risk parameter on this is going to kind of look like this. So down and then we're gonna have an, a risk parameter kind of like that, all right? Whereas with the regular butterfly, our risk parameter probably would look something like that. All right. You know, obviously uh, <laughs> a little bit better lines than that. But so this is where I'm talking about. We'd, we're going to add a little bit risk here so that we can eliminate all of the risk here. And the way we do that is we basically put in a synthetic short call spread in there so that we're adding a short call spread, which gives us that little bit of wiggle room. Now I'm gonna dig into this a little bit more, but ultimately because we're adding this short call spread in there, uh, and that's how we used to write it on the floor as a call spread. Uh, the short call spread adds the risk to the upside, but that's what getting that little bit of a credit, because we're gonna get a credit for this, that gives us that wiggle room to the downside, all right? So when you nail, you have to nail the number on the just call butterfly. Well, with this one, it gives us some wiggle room. So we want it to be neutral because we want the underlying to stay right there uh, at where our short strikes are, because that's where we're going to get the most money. But if the underlying trails off to the downside, we're OK with that as well. All right. Everybody good there so far? Uh, and I guess I kind of already went over this. I got a little ahead of myself. The traditional butterfly, you must nail that number, all right? Uh, it does take a lower margin requirement because, you know, with this one, I mentioned that short call spread. That's what's going to increase our uh, our uh, margin requirement on it. But with a broken wing butterfly, we actually have a higher profit potential. And that's because if you eliminate all one side of this transaction to the downside, the probability uh, of that happening, you know, is much greater than the probability of just the regular butterfly. You can't have that move back or forth because you'll have a loss. But, you know, vice versa, when you have that higher profit, anytime you're going to have a higher potential for profit or high probability of success, you are going to have a higher loss possibility as well. All right. And I mentioned this, we're going to be protected from the downside move. All right, so without further ado, let's get on with how we do this. Picking the right underlying. And I I talk about this all the time. We have to have a tight bid ask. Let me just shrink that there. We need to have a tight bid ask. And what this is, is on, uh, if we're talking about XYZ stock, all right, whatever stock it is, if it is a stock that is less than $100, if it's less than $100, we need to have our bid ask 
let me just do this bid uh, ask our bid ask needs to be equal to or less than 10 cents wide all right if it's greater than a hundred dollars stock if it's greater than a hundred dollars stock then basically we just move the decimal all right we're just going to kind of do that with the decimal point, all right? So if it's a $200 stock, you can see we'd move the decimal three ticks to the left and we'd be talking about 20 cents, all right? So something along those lines is an example, all right? Uh, so here, let me pull up the platform and I'll just give you a little bit more detail on that. So let's pull this one up. I just happen to have City up, so let's just take a look at it and see if it would be a stock that we could talk about. Say for instance, we've got a neutral bias with XYZ stock, which just happens to be city. First thing we're gonna do is, is this an underlying that is option tradable, all right? Or options appropriate in a sense. So we wanna go to the options that are closest to 35 days to expiration with this. And that goes for any of my transactions on if we are just looking at an option strategy in general. And the ones that have more legs, like this broken wing butterfly, this actually becomes a little bit more important, right? Because we have a lot of different legs and we don't wanna to have to give up the edges on all of those wings or all of those legs, because that will eat into our, our margin or our yield and make it a little bit more difficult for us to get it in and out of. All right, so what we want to do is look at these ones that are closest to 35 days to expiration. This is really the spot month. It's just where most of the eyeballs are, you guys. So we're going to look at this, say it's less than $100 stock. I say 10 cents wide from the bid to the ask. So you look at these options that are just out of the money on the calls and in the puts, and you can see that that fits that rule, all right? So it's inside of that. That would be something that's good. We can look at uh, something like Costco. This is the one where we would do the uh, move the decimal three ticks to the left and kind of go, all right, one, two, three, and then we're looking at 30 cents wide. So when we do that, we cut, go back down to here. These options just out of the money, you can see even on a stock that is uh, pretty high priced, we're getting that inside of that 30 cents wide across the board. And this is during open market operations, you guys. If you're doing your analysis after the close, keep in mind that our orders, or a lot of people orders, or a lot of our orders are being canceled as soon as the market closed. So right now the market's just closed. So orders are constantly coming out of the market because, you know, who wants to take risk overnight and then tomorrow morning something happens and, you know, there's a tweet out about tariffs or something and all of a sudden you're getting hit on those. So Wait till you're, you know, do some of your analysis after the close for sure, but, you know, make your ultimate decision whether that's the right underlying uh, during the day session for that, all right? And, you know, there are stocks that I look at like uh, Biogen. It doesn't always fit that rule. You'll see here, it's actually really wide right now, but my rule here would be move the decimal three ticks to the left, it's 30 cents. These are usually 30 to 40 cents during the open market operations, you know, maybe 40 cents. So it's just a little bit outside of that. So there's something I also talk about, you know, with these things, you know, we have all of these different rules and we're going to have like the traffic signal. So you're going to have the, uh, you know, some of them will be red lights, some of them will be yellow lights and some of them will be green lights, right? If it fits my rule perfectly, then obviously it's a green light. Something like Biogen, uh, I would say that that is more of a yellow light then. You need to be in this a little bit more often, know where the pricing is, know what you can kind of get away with. I don't want you to have to sell the bid every single time because there's only one guy in there trading it, right? Um, we want to be able to get into a situation where, you know, because if I had to give up this big of an edge, you know, all the way down there, 70 cents to hit the bid there, uh, or in this case, when we're buying the first one, you know, give up 70 cents, buy the 320s, and then we skip a strike or we go a strike out and I have to sell all the way down to the 1040s, which is, you know, giving up another 90 cents or something like that. That makes this spread not really work out. Yes, it's going to try and give you the mid market. But again, if we went mid market on these, we're still giving up a huge chunk of money, probably more than that 30 cents in it. Uh, 
some regards. All right. So we don't want to get involved in that where we have to give up too much edge, especially on multiple leg strategies like this one. So kind of follow that rule, move the decimal three ticks to the left on ones that are greater and uh, any stock under a hundred dollars, we want it to be equal to or 10 cents wide to the bid ask, right? The right environment, I mentioned this, we want high implied volatility percent, all right? So um, I talked about this, I wanna get rid of that. Uh, we want a high IV, all right? Implied volatility and percent. What this is, is we look at any given underlying, we need to know where X, Y, Z's implied volatility percent is, all right? And what I mean by that is every underlying has a different implied volatility uh, range that it has. Uh, if we're talking about tech stocks, those usually have higher implied volatility across the board. They never will dip. Their volatility may always be 40 and above, where if you look at uh, Johnson & Johnson or something like that, Johnson & Johnson may very well never get up to uh, implied volatility of 40. So let's just uh, take a... Um, let me pull up the other platform. Uh, let's pull up this one because I can just flip through over here on the side. Uh, for instance, let's go over to the charts and a good example always that I know always has high implied volatility is Tesla. So you can see Tesla is one of those ones that has implied volatility of 40, all right? And that's about as low as it goes. It's the lowest we've seen the entire year, which means that Implied volatility is low for Tesla. Well, what does that mean? Well, it just what we're trying to do with this implied volatility percent is discern whether or not these options premiums are cheap or expensive. And if implied volatility is really low at 36 for Tesla, we know that those are the cheapest. These are the cheapest these premiums have been all year. So in that case, this would be an opportunity to be a, a buyer of options premiums because we can see when options premium is that low, it has a tendency to start spiking up. And as a matter of fact, you would have to imagine that it would want to come back up to around 55, 56 or something like that. And therefore, if option, it, you know, volatility tells us that it affects the premium, right? For every one percentage point move higher, our options premium is going to be affected by the Vega, all right? So for every 1% increase over here, these premiums are going to increase by 30% or 33 cents, all right? So we wouldn't want that. I already said we want high implied volatility because we want that volatility to come out. And if we go over and look at, say for instance, uh, the chart here, you can see Ulta has extremely high volatility right now. That same kind of 45-ish is extremely high for Ulta, but that was really low for Tesla. Well, this is telling us though that these premiums in Ulta are about as, as expensive as they're going to get, all right? So this, even though the implied volatility number, just this implied volatility number is about the same as Tesla, it's telling us a different story. So the reason why we need to come up with implied volatility percent is to know whether or not, you know, we should be selling these premiums or buying these premiums. Now, Ulta would be a perfect example of an opportunity to be selling those premiums because we want volatility to contract with this strategy. And this would be an opportunity where, yes, we would want to start selling premium. Now, Implied volatility percent is a pretty easy coefficient to come up with. And ultimately, what we're doing is we're going to be looking at the current IV. All right. So you take the current IV, which is 47, and subtract that by the low IV. All right. And you take that sum and divide it by the high IV minus the the low IV, all right? So for instance, in this one, we're kind of looking at uh, implied volatility being like 47 
is the current minus the low we can see is around 20. So 47 minus 20, and then we take the high, which is uh, take that sum and divide it by the high, which is 50, and subtract it by the low, which is 30. So basically, you're coming up with uh, 27 divided by, or uh, 27 divided by, why is that coming out? Oh, sorry, because this is 20. 27 divided by 30. So you can basically see that we are in the 90 plus percentile, all right? I'll, you know, just doing the math in my head, you know, three divided by, or uh, 27 divided by 30 is kind of where, somewhere in the 90 percentile, all right? So, and that was just kind of rounding it up. You know, there is that over there, the IV percent, I have the, the code that you can throw in there uh, to figure all that out. And ultimately, what we just want to know is, is it, you know, IV is greater than, implied volatility percent is greater than 50, all right? That's what we're looking for there. So we want it in the upper bounds because anytime it gets up here, you can see that it wants to trickle off. This is a really good example. And, you know, anytime you get a binary event, you're gonna get volatility to crush because, uh, you know, all, all the news is out. We all know about it afterwards. That's why I have specific strategies for those earnings. But, um, you know, if there wasn't, I wouldn't suggest doing this strategy when there is a binary event, which I believe Ulta has one coming up relatively soon. It just seems like Ulta usually kicks off earnings. And here we are again, uh, looking at Ulta for earnings. Why can't you find my Ulta? So you can see that's the reason why volatility is really going higher in Ulta is because they have an earnings event inside of this month that I was looking at. So not necessarily the best strategy for uh, an earnings event, but I'm trying to get impress upon you right now that we're looking for something that has high implied volatility percent because that tells us where pricing is for XYZ. And we want to sell it when it's expensive pricing. Um, I'm going to show you an example here in a minute. I had to dig pretty deep to find a really good example of when volatility is really wide and versus when it's a really high versus when it's really low that uh, it, it will affect your strike location. For instance, when if I if we did this when implied volatility percent is extremely low, all right, our um, chart. Remember when I was talking about? Let's just do this as you know a line in the sand for delineation as to where the current underlying is. All right, uh, and then if I took a, a butterfly when it was in really or a broken wing butterfly when it was in really low implied volatility percent. It's going to kind of look like this. Oh, I don't, I don't want the line anymore. Uh, it's going to come across and then it's going to be really steep like that. Right. But then when the implied volatility, if IV percent is really high, you know, our strategy is going to look more like this. All right. You know, that's a terrible drawing, but you guys get my drift where, you know, it gives us wiggle room in both directions. Whereas here, it's gonna be a little bit more steep when you have that low volatility because our strike locations are gonna be so much closer to one another. When you have that high implied volatility percent and we know that those premiums are really expensive for this underlying, then our legs are gonna be able to, you know, the premiums get pumped up. We're gonna be able to get further away from uh, one another. So that's why it's important to also have high implied volatility percent. All right, so now we're gonna be looking at the right duration. All right, this is a, a premium collection type strategy. Like I said, we're gonna do this for, you know, either zero money or a slight credit so we can eliminate all risk to the downside in this one. So in that kind of case, anytime we were talking about the, you know, uh, the volatility contraction. Remember I said we we're going to exploit Vega. We want uh, Vega to go down there for the environment. Well, here, 
the duration, we want theta, um, theta to go down as well, or actually, you know, eat away. We want theta to eat away at our pricing. So anytime we're looking at something like that, we're going to be talking about the at the monies here. And you can see, I talked about 35 days to expiration here, right? So you can see volat or the theta really starts eroding quickly. And on the floor, we used to call theta the thief in the night that used to come and steal our premiums. If we got way out here, it would take a long time for theta to start eating away at our premiums. So we want to get inside that 35 days to expiration or about as close as we can. Sometimes, you know, we're right in that, uh, we're right in that middle between, you know, we saw the ones where it's out here at 51 days, but, you know, as close to 35 days as we can. Sometimes, you know, 45 days to expiration is uh, where you're going to have to roll if you're inside of, you know, if it's less than 20 days to expiration on your options, you're going to probably go look out there to the 45 days to expiration on this. All right. Otherwise, again, your uh, your legs are going to be very tight and, you know, your um, strategy is going to be very steep on that analyze tab. All right. Any questions so far? Doesn't look like it. All right. The strikes, all right. The big thing here is we want to do this. We want to build this for a credit, all right? We want a credit for this because again, if we're adding risk to the upside, we want to eliminate the downside risk. So if we look at it as an analyze tab and we kind of go and look at the traditional butterfly versus the broken wing butterfly, you've seen me draw this. This is the line of delineation of break even in a sense, and we would, have risk to the downside and to the upside. But our call spread here, when we add that synthetic call spread, you know, because basically what we did here is you can see it's the 41, 44, 47. So that's equal distance, right? Three in between each of those, all right? So what we're doing in a sense is we are going to be selling we would be selling in this case, this is a really old example and this is what I wanted to bring up because um, it was one of those examples where uh, high implied volatility versus low implied volatility. This had really high implied volatility percent. So uh, basically we would be selling the March, uh, that's the symbol for March, by the way, uh, symbol for March, so selling the March 47 calls and then buying the 50 calls. All right. So we're doing the 47, you know, selling the 47 and buying the 50 calls. That's that synthetic call spread in there. All right. That's the call spread that enables us to get rid of that downside risk. So if you go over here, it's synthetic because you don't really see it. When you build out the butterfly, a normal butterfly like this, that's how it would look. But if I go in there and then just click on, okay, I want to sell those 47s and buy the 50s, then you can see that we would end up with the strategy that looks like this. Now you can see with the 50 calls in there, I bought, uh, sold out the 47 calls. That short call spread creates that no risk to the downside. But it also, like I said, will increase your margin requirements on this type of trade. So um, I wanted to get that out of the way real quick. Uh, I see a question real quick. So far, the question is, is this recorded? Hope so. I think I need to watch this 16 times. Ian, it, it's pretty, I'm hoping by the end of this, because we're going to, I'm going to pound all of this stuff into your head as we go along. So uh, a lot of things might be flying by real quick, but I think, you know, I'm going to say them over and over again as we go through it. And as a matter of fact, I'll show you the example when we pull up the regular screen. But take a look at this. This is BBB or BBY, Best Buy, all right? And you can tell it's a really old example because we're trading at 40, you know, 44 is the strike location. 41 was the at the monies that I was looking in this example for this. But if I take a look at, Best Buy right now, this is why you're going to be able to see that Best Buy is uh, a lot different right now. So Best Buy, let's take a look at this, 80 some dollar strike. As a matter of fact, you can tell 
if I go and look at my um, three-year chart, you can tell I was looking at this strategy way back when, all right? Um, maybe even longer ago than that. Best Buy has done very well. But what I want to show you here is Best Buy just had its earnings. It's gotten volatility crush. Its volatility is at, you know, uh, the lower bounds. It actually creeped up a little bit today. Um, <clears throat> And from when I actually was looking at this earlier. But for instance, we were looking at those 40, it went 41, 44, 50, right? So I basically skipped or I went $3 wide on this. There is no way that I could go $3 wide on this. And even if we did the uh, at the monies, which I don't want to do the 80 and a half. So I'm going to do the 81s. So let's look at buy this one. So we buy the 81s. And if I were to even try and go out, uh, let's say $5, or this, we're going to go with $1. $1, sell those two. Actually, yeah, because it's got the mid strikes. Let's look at these. Forget that. Um, Best Buy question with the weeklies. Just make sure that Best Buy's weeklies, if you were going to go to that closest 35 days, yes, you can use weeklies on this. But just make sure it fits that rule of, you know, uh, less than 10 cents wide. It's not right now because it's after the close. It will during the day. So I want to do use this one so we can uh, use these strike locations a little bit closer. So for instance, um, in this one example of Best Buy, we were using the 41, 44, 50. Well, this one, it's twice as high now. And so you would expect that we would at least be able to go that wide. But if I went $3 wide here to the 83s and then sold those twice, right? And then went out to the um, uh, 83. So we got to skip the 86s and go to the 89s to do that. You know, we're going to still get about a 6-6 six, six credit, but very, oh, sorry, I did it wrong. So the 81s were buying, the 83s were selling twice. And then we go out to the 89s and buy that one, all right? So it, it, it will work here in this example. The thing to note here is um, that we would be able, to, we should be able to have these strikes uh, down here much wider, you know, because we're assuming the price of this stock is twice as much. So, you know, those premiums, for each one of these underlying should be, you know, a lot more expensive for this. So although that other example had really high implied volatility, you can see with volatility really low for Best Buy now that we are only able to create the same widths in a sense. Does that make sense? You guys kind of get where I'm going with that? Like we should expect with a higher price stock you know, $100 stock versus a $25 stock that our strikes should be incrementally wider, right? Because the premiums that we would receive for these are going to be much greater, all right? Does that make sense? You're able to create it almost the same way, but, you know, does that make sense with this higher price stock? You know, a 10% correction on a $40 stock is a lot less than a 10%, you know, it's half as much as a 10% correction on an $80 stock. So make sure you don't fall into just not paying attention to the implied volatility on this, all right? Because that implied volatility here, those, those were pretty wide compared to, you know, an $80 stock being wide. Uh, do you look at the high... Open interest, um, open interest. You you can for sure because you know the thing is is they are pretty much one and the same. When you have high volume and open interest over here, you can see that uh, Best Buy has a lot of volume and open interest going on. Excuse me, during any given day. All right, so you do want to see that where there's a lot of participation and all these strikes that are just out of the money. Having said that, that's going that's reflective of there being a lot of eyeballs on there. So 
yes, you can look at the volume and open interest. Just make sure there's a you know good participation in there. But know that if if you were just looking at the the delta, the gamma and the theta and stuff like that, and then looking at the bid offer here, if you see that it fits my rule, you know intrinsically that there is a lot of uh, a lot of volume and open interest going along with that, right? All right, so we talked about uh, the strikes. We wanna make sure we do this for a credit because if we're adding that short call spread in there, selling the March 47th, which, you know, so we're long that. So we'd sell one March 47 call and buy one March 50 call. That creates the uh, broken wing butterfly, which is what we see here. And so that synthetic short call creates that uh, no downside risk. Now, to get out, we need to know what our exit is. Basically, we are looking at taking 50% of our max profit. All right, that's our profit target, is going 50% of that max profit. Well, how do we figure out our max profit? It's pretty simple. It's basically that middle strike minus the lower strike, all right? So it's that smaller uh, uh, call spread plus the net credit, all right? And times 100 I have in there, that could be a little confusing, but basically it's the width of the short strike, or the width of that smaller strike plus the net credit, all right? So that's why on the upside, our max loss is the higher strike minus the skip strike minus the net credit, all right? And I'm gonna pull this all up on a, uh, Another platform, I see somebody's asking a question real quick. Oops. All right, the break even is a skip strike plus the net credit, all right? We have to know what the width of the spread is as well. Um, I see a bunch of questions. I'm gonna show this on the chart. It'll be much easier, yes. Uh, let's just do that without further ado. Let's skip on with this. All right, so an example, somebody, um, were you analyzed? Yeah, let's do the analyze tab. So here, I'm gonna go straight to Apache, all right? Now you guys see, this is one of those examples where I have a position in it. So, uh, you know, don't fault me for that. I just put that on in the daily market commentary. I talked about it today. But it doesn't mean that we couldn't have, you know, more of a neutral bias. That's why I sold those was for a neutral bias. We can see that it's at near lows. If I pull this back up to the daily market comment or the, uh, the daily on a one-year chart. You can see it's right at the point of control. You know, we could easily say that this market is going to look to trend sideways within that range. So uh, I'm maybe worried about it coming down this way. So in that case, I have no worries about it being up here, but I may be worried about it trending down a little bit. But I think that, you know, I can nail the number on this one, let's just say. So we're gonna go up and uh, look at the trade. So let's just take a trade, for example. We're at the uh, the 23 strikes. So I'm gonna buy this one. I'm gonna go out and sell two of the 24s on this. So let's sell, I uh, bought the 23s, the 24s are here. So I'm gonna sell two of those. All right, now I'm gonna buy this one because this is the butterfly. This is the traditional butterfly, right? And I'm going to go over and just analyze the traditional butterfly. And let's get rid of, uh, which one's my traditional 23 and a half, 20. All right, so there's our traditional butterfly. We've got it. We can see where our break evens are. Now, here's what I was talking about, selling that synthetic one, right? So let's just say I go in and I sell out of this strike, so I'm basically switch it, selling the 25s and switching it to the 27s, right? Or the 26s. And then that didn't give me a credit, oh, because it's still locked. Um, so see how I just skipped that strike, pulled that out? Another way to look at it would be, is if I had this on the 25s, I can go in here, so I've got this traditional butterfly, I've got that long, now I'm holding down control, I'll sell, I'm gonna hit the bid, got rid of that, oh, all right, let's build this out again. 
buy this because it went to a 10, that's why. Sell two of those, and then I'm buying the 25s. Just leave it on the 10s. All right, so that's a demo. We've seen what that looks like on the Analyze tab, right? It's gonna give me both of them. All right, so that's that on the Analyze tab. Now I'm gonna go over here, and I'm gonna hold down the Control button. I'm gonna sell a call spread. So I'm gonna sell the 25s and buy the 26s. And buy the 26s. See how I did that? So now it creates that credit. If I take that over and analyze that one, get rid of the old one, you can see that it, it builds that out. Is that a little less confusing? You guys see how I was talking about the synthetic short in there? I'll do that one more time. So we're doing the 23s. Let me delete this trade. If I was gonna do a regular butterfly, I'd buy the 23s sell the 24s twice, and buy the 25s. That's your traditional butterfly. But what I wanna do is I wanna sell a synthetic short call spread, which, oops, come on. Buy the 23s, sell the 24s twice, buy the 25s, and then I wanna sell a synthetic short call spread, sell the 25s, and buy the 26s, all right? That's what creates a little bit more risk to the upside as opposed to the downside. So we can go over and look at the analyzed trade. If I just take off, let me do this, take off this one, analyze this as the 25s, take that off. Now, so this is your regular butterfly. You can see our loss to the downside is 12 cents or you know $112. Now, if I take this one off and add this one, you can see that we increase the risk to the upside, right? So now it is our risk to the upside is about $600 and to the downside, it is nothing. So we increased the risk to the upside, but eliminated all of it to the downside. Okay. That makes sense so far? Would you try and set the break even to the top of the channel? Um, what I try and, I don't know if I understand what you're asking there. The top of the channel over here. For me, I would probably try and set it, you know, right around where the break even is. I think it's gonna probably hang out or, or hang out around this point of control. So for me, uh, I would probably try and set it up in a pretty close to where it's at right now, which is kind of the way I set that up with the 23s, the 24s, because I think that it's gonna kind of stick right here, you know, 23, 24 area. All right. All right, here, I'll give another example. I'm gonna look at one uh, you can do this for ETF. So one thing I said with implied volatility percent was, you know, for XYZ stock, it needs to be greater than an IV percent of 50. Well, with ETFs, I do have that as a little bit lower. So for ETFs, as an example, we usually look at it to be above an IV percent of around 30 because it rarely will spike on those. So TBT, uh, if you guys know, I think that interest rates are likely to go lower rather than higher. TBT is inverse related. So uh, that would expect it to go lower, if not stay right where we are. I do not expect them to raise interest rates. So um, I would be worried more about the downside, but I think we're gonna stick right here where we're at. So with this one, I would look to sell a um, broken wing uh, called butterfly in this example. So let's just look at it. We could do the 25s, we're gonna buy those, sell two of the 26s, and then skip the 27s and go to the 28s and buy that. So that one's not gonna work. I might have to go to the 24s. Buy the, I might actually have to do the half ticks on, on uh, TLT or TBT. Um, so 24s I'm buying once, let's go to the 25s, sell those twice and then Skip the 26s. Wait, what's happening here? 
delete that. So I'm going to buy the 24s, sell the 25s twice, skip the 26s and go to the 27s. It's not going to work. 24, 25, 26, 27. So it's still a debit. So this is an example I wouldn't do it, right? I would not increase my risk to the upside without eliminating to the downside. So maybe I'll just go over at um, TLT. TLT, let's take a look at that one. It's a higher price stock. So, you know, and another thing is anytime you get below $25, it makes it much more difficult unless you have super high implied volatility. So um, for TLT, I'm probably gonna, let's just say, I think interest rates are, you know, gonna, uh, for this one, interest rates are gonna go up. So I'm, I'm worried about interest rates going up and price going down. So, uh, we do the at the monies or just in the money. Let's just do the at the monies. So I'm going to buy these. I'm going to sell the 40. Uh, let's try and sell the 42s twice. Skip the 43s and go to the 44s and buy that one. All right. You can see it's a, a ETF above. So that ends up working out. So an ETF above it. This one would work out if I was... Uh, worried about the downside in TLT, which would mean that I was worried about interest rates going up. Uh, do you want them to go uh, go into expiration? No, I think that's what you're saying. Um, is that what you're saying, Zev? I, I only want to get 50% of my max profit. So we talked about our max profit on this one. If we go over and look at the analyze on this. Um, our max profit here is just over uh, $1,000 for a 10 lot, so over $100. And if we look at this, it's because it's the width of our spread, so a dollar plus the credit. So it's $112 is our max profit. So I would be looking to get out of this when it is trading for about, you know, slightly better than, you know, like say a 55 cent credit. So our max profit is the width of this short spread or this uh, short, lower spread, the long call spread is what I should say. The width of the long call spread plus the credit. That's our max profit, all right? And the reason why our max loss here is only you know, the width of the shorts or the long, I don't know why I keep saying that, the long call spread plus the, or in a sense, the skip spread plus the width of the long call spread where I was confusing everybody. Just know it's the width of this minus the $12. Just think about it. If the market goes higher, the market starts trending higher, I'm going to get all the money for the width of this strike, right? for the width of this call spread. This long call spread is gonna be worth a dollar, which causes my break even to be right around that 43 strike, which is lined up right here, right? Because as the market goes higher, all right, I get the long call spread, which helps me out. So right there, 42 is the break even on it. But then that long call spread, I've gained a dollar on it. So that starts helping me out as the market continues. So that long call spread dollar, you know, it, its strength is gone once we hit 43 because that dollar puts the break even at 43, all right? Now my max loss on this is the next dollar higher, but I get to keep this credit. So it's that next dollar higher minus the 12 cents. So it's gonna land, the break even is gonna end up being right at uh, 143.88 is gonna be where my uh, max loss is. All right, so basically 88 cents to the upside. Does that make sense? Do I, good question, do I use a stop loss on this? No, I'm going to probably ride this one out, right? Because I'm gonna play the probabilities on a defined risk strategy. I will let that defined risk strategy play out. I don't, I don't get out 
uh, for any loss other than the max loss. I'm going to write it out because I'm expecting the market to pay, play out through those probabilities and come back down. Do I use, I don't leg out of these spreads. When I was on the floor, I used to leg out of spreads. I do not leg out of spreads anymore because, you know, 50% of the time you're going to leg out of them better and 50% of the time you're going to leg out of them worse. Well, those 50 of the time, 50% 50 of the time you leg out of them worse, you are going to lose a lot more money than what you were able to gain on legging out of it right. I, I can almost guarantee you. So I would suggest not legging out of spreads. It's, it's a crapshoot anymore. On the floor, we had different advantages, right? I could, I could lean on orders. You can't lean on orders anymore. And leaning on orders is just, you know, there, there is paper on one side and bid, you know, you, you got out of it for the bid on one side and you know you can lean on paper on the other side. The algos eat that stuff up anymore and it doesn't work. You can't lean on anything anymore. So I would not leg out of it. But do you guys get what I'm saying with this downside? All right. So our max profit is the width of the long call spread plus the credit, that's our max profit. I'm looking to get out of this. So my max profit is a dollar plus the 12. I'm looking at getting out of this for somewhere around 55, 56 cents, all right? Because that's 50% of the max profit. The break even is easy to figure out. It's basically this long, what the price of this long call spread is plus that credit. So it's basically, you know, at 43, 12. 12 is our break even because we get the long call spread plus the credit. That's our break even to the upside. And then our max loss is the width of the short call spread minus the long call spread plus the credit, right? So, <laughs> I hope you can watch it again soon. So you want the price of the stock to rise to get to, I want it to rise, yes. And if it goes up here and tags that 142 area, you are most likely going to be at 50% of your max profit, all right? The only way to get max profit is on the very last day settlement. We are right here at 142. But if the market goes up and trades at 142, I'm going to be right there very close to 50% of my max profit. All right, which is very neutral bias, right? And that's why I'm saying you want a neutral bias uh, with a little bit of wiggle room. You could do the in the monies, which, you know, then your short strike would be right where it's currently trading. With this strategy, I usually do my long strike, you know, at the money, all right? And the reason why is because I'd rather have a little bit of wiggle room if the market rallies up just a little bit and I get to that point then I know I'm probably at 50% of my max profit immediately. And if the market goes down, which is what I would be worried about in this scenario, uh, then, um, you know, I get to keep this 12 cents. And I'm going to, if it goes down, I'm probably going to write it out for much longer. You know, maybe even into expiration. How, uh, how do you get to 75% of max profit? You're going to have to be inside like seven days to expiration and have it basically be right there at 142. You're going to have to have a lot of volatility come out. All right. You're going to have to have the direction. You're going to have to be nailing that number and, um, and very close to expiration. As you guys know, Anytime you're in a butterfly, those butterflies take very long uh, to really whittle away and be, get close to max profit, all right? Uh, so this is very similar to the butterfly, right? That's a broken wing butterfly. So it's going to take a lot longer uh, time to whittle away at that. So that's why I'm saying get out with the 50% of max profit if you have the opportunity. Do I defend or change the position, roll it, et cetera? You can roll it as long as you get a credit, all right? Say, for instance, it started going down this way. Yes, you could definitely roll it out, get another credit, uh, and continue with that assumption for sure. So, yes, you can roll it out. 
Uh, do I defend it by rolling, um, like buying this 44 and going down to the 43? No, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, I'm not gonna do any of that. I'm, like I said, anytime I put on these defined risk strategies like this, where I know my risk parameters to the upside and the downside, I'm likely to let it all play out if it is a max loser, you know, the market rallies up and there's still 15 days to expiration. I'm going to let it ride out because I'm believing it. Unless your assumption changes, if your directional assumption changes, anytime your directional assumption changes about this underlying, then get out of that strategy. I don't care if it's a winner or a loser or if it's 50% of max profit or 5% of max profit, all right? or a hundred, you know, whatever. Anytime that assumption changes, you guys, get out. You get that gut feeling saying, I think I'm wrong on this all of a sudden because maybe it's something you heard or, or just your gut's telling you. Get out, I can't emphasize that enough, you know. Um, anytime your assumption changes or your gut tells you to get out, get out uh, immediately. Don't wait and say, let's just see if my gut's right. Most likely your gut's right. Your lit and because your gut is your limit, you guys, and that can process so much more information than you can understand. That's where you get those gut feelings, is it from your limbic, and it doesn't have the ability to have a voice or to have uh, um, language. It can only give you a feeling. And I believe in that. You know, I mean, listen, I talked about, I was started out with psychology and went into finance. So I, and I've talked about with trading. I think that trading, uh, uh, my trading is more, uh, or my, sorry, my psychology degree was more important to my trading than even my finance degree. And I completely agree with that. So go with your gut, your assumption changes, your guts telling you get out immediately. All right. Pull the rip cord. But with me on this, if my assumption was still that the market was going to go down, I don't care if it's trading 148. Uh, I'm, I'm sticking with it because I believe that maybe, you know, the market presses the extreme sometimes and then it'll snap back. But if I got up here and I started saying, oh my God, well, I, you know, they're lowering interest rates at the next meeting. Well, then I would get out. If the data told me, you know, all of a sudden the market went into the tank and all of a sudden we're in a recession, then they're going to probably lower our interest rates. Well, I wouldn't want to be in this trade anymore, right? So... You know, all of those things, if your market assumption changes, get out, you know, no matter what. Um, if your assumption's still to change, and I was trading up here, if my assumption was still the same, then I would stick with it. So I'm not gonna roll in and out of that. Okay. All right, I'm running a little long in the tooth here. Uh, watch this again. I know some of you guys might be a little confused. Hopefully that, uh, going over it again will help you. Maybe even watch one of the other ones. Maybe I explained it a little bit better in some of those other ones. But again, the max profit is that middle strike minus the lower strike. Remember, that's the one we bought at, this is the one that's at the money. So it's the width of that spread plus the credit we got. And then our max loss is that higher strike minus the skip strike, which is that you know, 43 in the example, minus the net credit, which would have been like the dollar 12. But basically the idea is you get that, this, this one, your max profit adds to your risk to the upside, which is to that skip strike, right? Do you have training videos for this type of setup? Um, you know, watch the daily market commentaries and watch one of these other videos. But yeah, these are kind of what we're, we're trying to do with the, uh, the videos to to make sure you you get it straight. I hope I explained it. Did anybody else have any issues? Because I want to make sure you guys are clear of concept before we go. Would you use the regular butterfly and depending on the direction you use for the spread? Um, I think I said that for uh, if I was going to do the regular butterfly, I would be thinking you know X Y Z stock was going to be staying exactly where the underlying was. So in this case, we are looking at TLT. If I thought, if I wanted to do the butterfly, I would think maybe, all right, it's gonna stay within here. And that's my assumption, right? Then I would look to do a butterfly. 
because I think I can nail the number. I think we're right. As a matter of fact, you know, I mean, I probably would do a butterfly in TLT because, you know, I've talked about with the bonds and the daily market commentaries, and that's not the bonds, obviously. But the bonds, I think that we're going to be sticking in and around this 160 handle right here. So I think that 160 is really where the market's going to be trading, and we're going to be trading in a pretty tight range because I don't think the Fed is going to raise interest rates or lower interest rates anytime soon. So I think that we're going to stick right in and around here. So that would be a case where I am completely neutral bias. There's there's where I'm going to look to try and nail the number, right? But in the case of me worried about one direction or the other on this one, if I was a little bit worried about the market coming back down or higher interest rates, then that's where I would be creating the broken wing butterfly because I want to eliminate this, this side of the risk. You know, I, I'm not at all, I'm not at all worried about this happening, but I am kind of worried about this happening down here. All right. I think like this is, there is no question. There's no questions. It's going that way. All right. Good seminar. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ian. I appreciate the kind words. Um, Theo, you get what I'm saying there then? And Zach, you got my, uh, I think I answered your question on when I would do uh, the, the, uh, the two different ones, right? This would be a case for a butterfly. And if I was no question to the upside, but worried about the downside here, that would be where I would be looking for the broken wing butterfly. So it all kinds of depends on your directional assumption. That's why I'm kind of like with this whole course, I see there's a lot of new names out there. You know, with this whole course, the idea is we've come up with a directional bias, right? And with this particular bias, you know, I'm looking at X, Y, Z, and I say that I'm not worried about the upside at all with this one, but I am, and I think it's going to stay right here. Like, I think the market is staying, I believe it's going to stay within this area here. Uh, but, you know, this, you know, down here is a big question mark. You know, up here, there's no question. I don't, there's no way. You know, my th assumption is it's not going there, but I am worried about down here. All right. So that would be the broken wing. You know, so this all of a sudden, that's where we come up with our broken wing butterfly fly, right? Because we're neutral or we're equal to uh, equal to negative bias in a sense. I'm, I'm worried about this negative side. So in that case, you know, equal to negative bias, we might want to look to implement this. But I'm I'm more neutral, right? I'm more neutral on this. I think I think this 160 handle is going to be something we're talking about for the next month in bonds, All right? Can I uh, buy your video about earnings season strategies? Yeah, absolutely. You can uh, reach out to us, even though uh, I don't have this one up. You sh and you guys should, because well, right now, you know, even the earnings are kind of very close to coming over. And I thank you for asking the question. Earnings are almost over. You can see it's pretty thin, but with that earnings, course, what you can see is we can take advantage of all of this stuff down here where, you know, we don't have earnings and we have super, super low implied volatility. And I've been talking about this in the daily market commentaries. It's time to start taking advantage of debits uh, type of strategies where we're paying for it. Um, well, with the earnings setups, we actually are getting set up for the next earnings season for these. All right. So earnings are going to be just around the corner in January. We can start setting up strategies for earnings and take advantage of the implied volatility expanding going into that. So it's not just about those earnings specific trades. But yeah, Theo, if you uh, I think it was Theo that asked about it. Um, oh, Michael. So reach out to us. We have other ones. Um, these don't have the earnings, but you can reach out to us at 310-598-6677. Talk to those guys about the earnings uh, course because you can get that. But right now with this one, we're giving you guys the deal on all four of these courses where you get trading options with volatility crush. That's going to explain in detail how volatility works, 
what historical volatility means versus uh, the implied volatility, how you can differentiate those, why I use implied volatility versus historical volatility. All right, know when you can sell those based on the volatility. Also, floor trader hacks. These, these are great, like, I try to come up with little ways, nuanced ways for you guys to help remember some of this stuff. I know a lot of you guys are newer to options trading and you know we're talking about delta gamma theta and all of that stuff well i come up with like little things like you know theta is the thief in the night that comes and steals your premium that's as easy as it gets right theta is the thief correlate those kind of things so you know this is going to help you sleep at night this is going to streamline your process all right when we're going through all of this stuff how do we figure out all of these different numbers and all these crazy words these greeks and what they mean to me. So I talk about that. There's like nine floor trader hacks in there that'll help streamline your process, all right? And things that we used on the floor, because remember, we didn't have computers to figure all this stuff out. Yes, there's some ways that you can figure it out a little bit easier, like intrinsic and extrinsic value. Maybe you're gonna have to go through the math. I'm gonna show you quickly. You can just kind of ballpark it, right? And you can easily set up your process. And then options basics. So for some of you guys that are newer to trading, this is going to be great for you guys because I'm going to explain this from beginning to end on those basics, how, uh, what gamma means and how to figure out what those pricings are, exactly all of those things. And then also, you know, learn to trade like I do. You know, I'm trading with probabilities. If you can increase your probabilities of success, then that's what I'm doing. I want to play with the probabilities on my side. I don't want to, you know, if you're going out there and just buying stock, your probabilities of success are 50-50. I talk about strategies where your probabilities of success are greater than, you know, sometimes 85%, all right? So I would rather do that than just flip a coin on directional assumptions. So basically we're giving you guys the discount on all of those, as you can see here for 29 or $297, give yourself a Christmas gift. Literally, you guys, if, you, if you're trying to learn how to trade online and or watching mainstream media, these guys on CNBC and stuff, which, you know, I know those guys and, you know, um, but anyway, you know, they're not always giving you guys the best strategy for the directional assumption they're talking about. I'm telling you right now, it's just not the best. So, uh, Make sure you take advantage of that. Michael, you can reach out to us, like I said, if you have any questions at 310-598-6677 or, or email me at trading at protraderstrategies.com. Um, and then also, finally, I just want to thank you guys all for attending. You guys make it a lot better, I think, for everybody else, especially when you ask the questions. Put me on the spot. Make sure... Because if you are asking questions like, do you defend this strategy? And I'm going to give you my honest answer. No, I don't. But somebody else has that same question. You know, so make sure you guys participate. I think it makes it go a lot faster. And uh, you get your money's worth that way. Here's also that link. Oh, the link for this video is uh, in the chat window right now. I'm going to send that out. Uh, this is the link. If you're watching this on tape delay, you're watching it again. You're gonna to have to pause this and punch this all into your URL. But if you're watching it right now, take advantage of that hot link because that's gonna pop up the uh, Pro Trader Strategies course like that. I just hit my hot link and you can take advantage of it. You can see it's right here and uh, add that to your cart. So all of those, I mean, you guys, this will take you to almost summer if you watch all of these videos, each one of these. Uh, this There's much more in here. I think there's actually, uh, even I think that somewhere, yeah, there's like over 50, uh, extra recordings you can take advantage of. And each one of them, like I said, is, you know, probably over an hour long. So, you know, 50 hours of extra content if you take advantage of this today. All right. So make sure you hit on that hot link. Uh, we don't usually offer the extra bonuses there either with all the discounts. And as a matter of fact, the floor uh, trader hacks is usually one of the more expensive courses we do. So make sure you take advantage of that, all right? It's over there in the window. Uh, do you train about credit spreads? Absolutely, I actually talk about that uh, quite a bit. And uh, even in those earnings ones, I talk about credit spreads as well. This was just having to do with a directional bias with high implied volatility type course. But yeah, even on this course, 
that I've done, we have directional bias. And I talk about how to take advantage of with credit spreads, debit spreads, all of that stuff. All right, condors, I go through all of them. All right. All right, that's about it. Nobody else has any more questions, then uh, I'll move on. And uh, you guys have a happy Thanksgiving. Like I said, take advantage of this. You can click on the hot link in the chat window. Uh, and I'll see you next time. Have a great Thanksgiving. Don't eat too much trip to bean. And if you can't take that, take it easy. JQ showed up. All right, take care, guys. Bye for now.